Hello everyone and welcome back to our next lecture in our microbiology series. Um, this lecture is going to cover the chemistry of biology. So biological molecules, atoms, um, how atoms are put together and things like that. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing to start with um, that we need to talk about is what is an atom? But before we can talk about atoms and what they are and what make them up, um, we really need to talk about matter. So what is matter? You've probably heard that term before. Um, and matter is kind of a generic term for stuff that makes up stuff. Um, it's the material that gives uh, things their stuffitude, their stuff, their thingness, if you like. Um, it's what makes me able to pick my mouse up, and it's the, the mouseness of it, the sting of it. Well, anyway, um, matter is just kind of existence. So if you take a bunch of matter and you shove it all together, you're going to get uh, things that make up atoms. Um, and a bunch of matter shoved together is going to make protons, um, neutrons, and electrons. You've probably heard those terms before. Um, so protons, neutrons, and electrons are the three things that make up an atom. Um, protons, neutrons, and electrons are composed of smaller things, which are made of matter, blah, 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 you get the idea. Um, so anyway, um, an atom is kind of the smallest thing that you can identify as a pure substance that you can't cut in half, um, and if you do cut it in half, it's not that thing anymore of what it was. So um, a good way to look at this is like oxygen. So if you pulled an atom of oxygen out of the air, that atom oxygen would have everything inside of it um, that makes up oxygen. If you cut it in half, if you broke that atom up, it wouldn't be oxygen anymore. It would be something completely different. Um, and everything about that atom is oxygen. It's the smallest amount of oxygen that you can have without it not being oxygen anymore. Um, anything less than one atom is not going to be oxygen or that pure substance anymore. So that's kind of how that works. Well, an atom um, is made up of those three smaller things that I mentioned earlier, um, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now those three things are called subatomic particles, sub meaning smaller, um, meaning so smaller than the atom, subatomic, so smaller than the atom itself, so they're smaller than that. Um, protons have a positive charge to them. Neutrons have a neutral charge, so no charge at all. Um, and electrons have a negative charge to them, so it's just kind of how they are put together, the uh, um, electrical current that runs around them. So it's just kind of how they're put together. So um, every single atom on the planet regardless of how many protons, electrons, and neutrons you have inside of you, um, pretty much share the same kind of fundamental structure that all the rest of them do. Um, they have a nucleus in the middle of them um, that have all the protons and all the neutrons kind of shoved together in one big ball. Um, and you can see that in, over there on the, uh, the um, PowerPoint right here. Um, and around that nucleus, the electrons float around it. Um, now, they just float around the outside of that nucleus and hover around kind of space and take up uh, the rest of the space of the atom. Now, those electrons are really fast and really tiny, um, and it's really hard to tell where they are at any point in time. They're so fast. But regardless of how big your nucleus is, how few or how many protons you have, or how many uh, electrons you have, or how big or how small the um, way the cloud that the electrons spin around the nucleus in, um, all atoms are pretty much kind of be put together that same way. Nucleus in the middle, uh, electrons flying around the outside. So pretty simple on that one. Um, an element is the smallest amount of a substance that you can have that's going to give you this characteristics of, say, gold or um, carbon. And it's going to be predictable what it does. So if you've got six carbon or six protons, you're going to be uh, carbon. Um, and if you have six protons, that's just what you are. Uh, it's just kind of how that works. It's kind of like the chromosome number for humans or for animals. Um, the chromosome number defines what you are. If you have more or less chromosomes than, uh, say, a human that has 46 or 23 pairs, um, you're not going to be a human. You're going to be something completely different. And atoms work the same way. Um, so an element is going to be something that has the same number of protons, the same number of neutrons, the same number of, of electrons as every other atom around it. They're all the same. They're all chemically the same. They all match, and they're all going to behave the same way 
under the same chemical characteristics. So if I uh, expose one to this gas and the rest of them should all do the same thing as that one, um, it kind of makes sense on that. So atoms and electrons, um, elements and all that stuff, they're all tied together. So um, my picture is not showing up there for some reason. Um, but on your PowerPoint, you will be able to see a table um, of the major elements of life. It's got um, some of the carbons and how much of it is made up in life. Um, I don't know why it's not showing up here, um, but it's got the percentages of the major elements that break down um, and what percentage of the environment they are, uh, what percentage of the ecosystem they are, what percentage of us and other organisms they are, and things like that. So you can check that out on the, the PowerPoint posted for you. Um, well, atoms. So how do atoms behave? How do they get their characteristics? What do they do? How do we determine how they bond and why they bond the way that they do? Um, well, that's all determined by how an atom is put together. Um, so you've probably seen the periodic table before with this kind of symbol, um, with the atomic number, the uh, elemental symbol here, the elemental name, and the atomic weight. There are some periodic tables are a little different. These might be in different places, uh, but the idea is kind of all the same. They're uh, what they do. Well, anyway, um, this is the atomic number, and this is going to tell you the number of protons that's in an atom. So this would be like the chromosome count, if you like. Um, the number of protons defines the atom. If you have one proton, you will always be hydrogen. You could have 9 million neutrons, 18 gajillion electrons, but you're still going to be hydrogen. You could have no pro uh, neutrons, no electrons, one proton, and you're still going to be hydrogen. That's just how that works. It's kind of like humans. If you have 43 chromosomes, you could have red hair, uh, brown hair, blonde hair, no hair. Um, you're still going to be a human. It doesn't really matter. Um, what your chromosomes, uh, or what the outside appearance is, what the chromosomes on the inside uh, determine what kind of species you are. Um, and that's the same way that works that an atom works with the proton number. So the number of protons is right here, the atomic number. This also tells you the number of electrons um, as well. So the mass number down here, um, also called the atomic weight, um, is going to be the added up number of protons and neutrons found inside of this atom. Now in this case, hydrogen doesn't have any neutrons on average, so it's just a proton floating around with one singular electron. Um, so the atomic weight would be one. Uh, now in the case of helium, it has two, or, uh, two protons and I think one neutron, the atomic weight would be three. Um, so that's kind of how that works. An isotope is a variant version of the normal form of an, an atom. Um, so you probably heard things like carbon-14. Um, so carbon normally has an atomic weight of 12, so it has six protons, six neutrons, adds up to 12. Um, carbon-14, you can't change the number of protein uh, protons, so it always has six. That's what makes carbon carbon. Um, it's going to have, instead of six neutrons, eight, um, which gives it the, carb the uh, atomic weight of 14 instead of 12. Um, so it just has a couple of extra neutrons inside of there. It could have more, it could have less, um, but as long as you have anything different than the average, um, it's going to be considered an isotope. And you can tell if this, uh, what percentage of the isotopes are right here. Um, so this is an average of the all, uh, overall average of all of the different uh, hydrogen atoms out there in the environment. And this, they happen to average out to 1.008 um, on the atomic weight. So some of them out there have neutrons. The vast majority of them do not, which is why it's such a low number. Now, if you see 1.3 like or 1.4 or like 1.6 or something like that, a lot of isotopes exist in this particular, um, uh, particular element. Um, that are going to be added together to give it a different atomic weight. So the more isotopes that this thing has, the more common they are in the environment, the higher this number is going to be average. Um, and that's what the atomic weight is, the number of neutrons and electrons that represent isotopes, that different number down here. If it's anything other than 1.0000 forever, um, the little 1.008, whatever this number is, is going to represent the isotopes. That's why it's not a, a whole number. So the atomic weight uh, down there at the bottom, the atomic mass, same thing. They're going to average up all the isotopes. I just mentioned that one. Um, orbitals, um, it's going to be the big cloud that rotates around the electron, uh, or sorry, around the nucleus where the electrons are going to be found. So you can see the nucleus here. Um, and these are the orbital shells floating around the outside of that nucleus. 
Um, so the nucleus in the middle and the orbital shells with the electrons floating around outside of it. Now these are sometimes called energy shells or valence shells. And the number of shells you have um, is very important and the number of electrons that you have um, are very important when it comes to chemical bonding. Um, so the number of electrons will influence what type of bond you have, who you can bond with, how tightly or how weakly you can bond, um, what if you're going to be a, a polar bond and things like that. Um, so we'll talk about that in just a second. So um, some biologically important atoms, you're probably familiar with a lot of these. Hydrogen, um, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, carbon makes up most of us. Uh, we're carbon-based life forms, nitrogen, oxygen, obviously you breathe it, chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus, things that are biologically important for life. Um, potassium, uh, phosphorus, things that make up uh, adenosine triphosphate, uh, phosphorus, ATP. Um, things that make up phosphate backbones for DNA. Um, so phosphorus, things that make up your proteins, your amino acids, sodium, nitrogens, your nitrogenous bases for DNA. So some of the really important biologically atoms um, you can see right here on this uh, PowerPoint, on this slide. Um, you can also see that they're atoms that are very likely to bond. Um, and that's kind of one of our key here. Um, if you're not going to be likely to bond with something, you're going to be an atom that's going to not be very quote-unquote useful um, in the sense of biology. If you don't bond, you can't form bonds with things, um, you're not going to be very useful for uh, chemical reactions and things like that. So unless the atom itself, like helium, or uh, neon, and argon, and things like that, um, are actually biologically useful to us as an organism, which they aren't, um, they're not going to really serve much of a function. So we need things that bond, things that don't, so we can break them down, build things up, um, and get them useful for us. So these are, once again, some of just the biologically important atoms that are found out there. So let's talk about um, chemical bonding, how chemical bonds form, what they form for, um, how they break apart, and some things like that. So first, before we do that, we got to talk about molecules and compounds. Um, so when atoms bond together, they're going to form one of those two things, either a molecule or a compound. So if you're a molecule, you're going to have one oxygen, one oxygen, one hydrogen, one hydrogen, 14 million hydrogens, 14 million oxygens. They're all going to bond together. Um, and that's a molecule. It's going to be one or more of the same atom bonded together. Um, so that's kind of what that one is. Um, whereas a compound is going to be um, more or one or more different elements stuck together. Um, so you can have carbon and oxygen, carbon and hydrogen, helium, oxygen, so on and so forth, um, all bonded together. And that's going to be our compound. So a molecule is going to be the same atoms, um, compounds going to be different atoms, um, and that's the difference between the two. So what we form uh, as a biological organism kind of depends on what we need them for um, and what we're going to have the uh, intended purpose of that particular thing that we're trying to build up uh, being used for. So um, if we form compounds or molecules, it really just depends. So um, we've already kind of talked about the mass weight and the formula weight a little bit. So let's get into chemical bonding. Um, one of the key cornerstones of biology um, chemistry is the formation of chemical bonds, how energy is transferred between electrons, how um, the biology of life is formed by building and breaking down um, compounds to make energy, to build structures for the body, to build structures for the cell, um, and things like that. So there are three main types of biological bonds, um, chemical bonds if you like, um, that we're going to worry about, covalent, ionic, and hydrogen bonds. Um, you've probably heard these terms before, um, so let's go over what they actually mean. So a covalent bond. Um, co meaning sharing, valence meaning the valence shell, um, means you share your valence shell. Now electrons um, overall, uh, this doesn't apply to about the, I think it's the fourth row of the periodic table down. Um, anything but higher than that, this rule kind of pretty much applies to. Um, if you have eight electrons floating around your outside valence shell, or two um, on the first one, so you can have two, um, anything more than two is going to have to go, so you can see that here. Um, this, these guys uh, have one, this is hydrogen, 
a nucleus in the middle, it has one electron floating around outside of it. Um, they want to have two on this very first ring. That's the most that they can have on this valence shell is two electrons. So anything other than two, they're going to want to share their valence shell with another electron, uh, another atom, excuse me, to get um, an, uh, get another electron. So they really want two to be happy. Um, without two, they're not going to be very happy. They're going to want to bond. Um, so they're going to look for something that has just one that they can bond with, um, or one empty space. So what's going to happen is this little helium, our hydrogen here, with its one electron, is going to find another hydrogen with its one little electron, and they're going to stick together. So um, you can either have two or zero, and you're happy with it. So what's going to happen is they're going to share their electrons. So this guy is going to go, whoop, I'm going to borrow it for half the time. Both of the electrons are going to swing around him. They're going to swing back around here, so both of them are over here. So prim tend my uh, mouse of both of the um, both of the electrons. You can see them swing around here, and they swing around here. So this one's happy because he's got two. The other one over there is happy because he's got none. And now he's happy because he's got two, and that one has none, and so on and so forth. So it's just a continuation um, until the end of existence when these two particular molecules break apart. And you can also have more than one sharing of electrons when you have an outer shell. So the outer shell, they want to have some sort of variation, eight or four or something like that. Um, so you can see these guys are going to share here. So it's uh, usually almost always eight. So this guy has four to start with. Um, he's going to share four with the other one. So you get eight in total. So eight's going to be shared between them. So four that he had to start with, he's going to share four from this guy. So he'll get eight that roll around him. They go over here, eight and eight, everybody's happy. So that's how that one works. So covalent bonds are pretty neat. It's the sharing of electrons to make both parties of the atom happy. Uh, now, there are two different types of covalent bonds. You have a polar covalent. Um, and a nonpolar covalent. And this has to do with the types of molecules and how big they are and how strong they are when they bond. Now, this is really easy to think about if you look at a, um, a, a racetrack. Um, so if you think about a racetrack with, if it's like this, um, just a regular circle, what's going to happen is the dogs um, are going to go around at an equal pace. All the dogs are going to go around at the same time. But if the racetrack is more shaped like this, um, what's going to happen is the dogs are going to spend a very short amount of time here and a very long amount of time over here. And that's what happens with atoms when you have a polar or a nonpolar bond. So let's talk about our water molecule here. We have oxygen and hydrogen. Now oxygen is a really large molecule. It's or a really large atom, excuse me. It's quite big, really large. Um, and so what's going to happen is when these when it bonds with hydrogen, you can see it's going to share these one electrons right here. So one here and one here. Um, oxygen has six elect uh, eight electrons. Yeah, uh, eight, sorry, six, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. You have six, it's going to share two with hydrogen. Sorry about that. Um, so it's going to share, no, it's eight. Yeah, it's eight. So it's going to share two with hydrogen. Um, and uh, so it's going to have, yeah, it's going to share these two with the hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't have any. Um, so it's going to share two with the hydrogen molecules. So the second that it bonds, what's going to happen is this hydrogen molecule is going to donate its electrons to oxygen. They're going to rotate around, which means that the hydrogen molecules are going to spend the vast majority of their time, the hydrogen electrons, I should say, floating around over here. They're going to spend a little bit of time over here. And a lot more time floating around the oxygen is because it's so big. Um, and that's how that works. So simply because the racetrack is way out of whack for the poor little hydrogens. Um, the lot of time around the oxygen, a little bit of time around the hydrogens, a little bit of time around the hydrogen, a lot of time around the oxygen, and that's kind of how the electrons travel on this. So if you have an equal racetrack where both sides are the same, um, what's going to happen is you're going to have so something like this. The electrons are going to spend their same amount of time over here, 
in the same amount of time over here. So what's going to happen is when the electrons travel over here, there's going to be a negative charge, um, and they're over here and a positive charge over here when they're gone, and then when they travel over here, they're going to have a negative charge over here, and then a positive charge over here. So it cancels each other out, um, and they travel around. As the electrons travel, their charge goes with them. Um, so when that happens, they cancel out real quick. There is no net charge on this particular molecule. It's not charged. When you're a polar molecule, however, um, you have a larger side of your racetrack, one side's bigger than the other. Um, what happens is the atoms are going to, or the electrons, so like this, are going to spend more time over here than over here, which leads to this side having a uh, negatively charged um, overall uh, charge to it. This side ends up having a positive charge to it because there's not as many electrons traveling around it as for as long. Um, so when it gets the electrons, it just gets them for a really short time, so it tends to stay positively charged. The other side, since it has way more electrons, tends to stay negatively charged. Um, so when you're negatively charged, you tend to stick to positively charged things. You're not forming a bond, you're just sticking like a magnet. And that's how water works. So um, you can see here that these hydrogens take on that positive charge simply because they're so much smaller. They don't get a lot of time with the electrons, so they take on a positive charge, um, which means the large oxygen of the water molecule next to them um, takes on uh, the, just the magnetic tendencies of sticking to it. So that's what happens. So since this big giant oxygen is negatively charged, it's going to stick to that positively charged hydrogen just like a magnet. And that's what forms hydrogen bonds. It's not a um, chemical bond per se. There's no sharing of atoms. Um, it's just a sticking like a magnet. Um, and that's what a hydrogen bond is. It's the sticking of a magnet, just electromagnetic forces between two uh, electro, two atoms, um, then there's no sharing of electrons. So it's not a real chemical bond, if you like. Um, it's just a force that holds two atoms together. Um, now, it can be broken very easily, um, and that's what allows water to do some very interesting things, like uh, freezing and not sinking. It gets lighter as it, as it uh, um, freezes and things like that. So very interesting properties of water um, are given to it by these hydrogen bonds. So the other one, um, are, is an ionic bond. Um, and an ionic bond occurs when one atom just takes away an electron from the other. Um, so I've got seven, I want eight, you've got one. It doesn't really matter if you have zero, you don't really care. Um, but to try to get eight is going to be a lot of work for an atom that just has one electron. But for an atom that has seven, trying to get one is really easy, but trying to give away seven is really hard. So essentially what just happens is one atom just steals an electron from the other one. So I've got seven, I'm just going to take one or two from you, and now I've got eight, and I'm happy. And you lost yours, and you have zero, and now you're happy. Um, and that's what an ionic bond is. They just take away the uh, electron from one atom and add it to themselves. Um, and that's how both atoms become stable. Um, they get to the eight or the two that they really like for having uh, electrons floating around them, um, and that's how they stay stable. Now, when this occurs, it adds a shift in um, charge. So if you recall earlier, um, protons and electrons are going to be occurring in the same number. You got two protons, you got two electrons, you got one proton, you got one electron. The charges cancel out each other. You got one negative electron, one positive proton, they cancel out each other for net charges of zero. Um, now, when this type of bonding occurs, this atom has lost one electron. It didn't lose its proton, you can't lose those. You can get rid of your electrons though. So when this occurs, now this atom has a positive charge to it. It lost its, its electron, so the one little negative's over here, but now it's just a positive charge. It has a plus one positive charge to it. If it lost two electrons, it would be plus two. If it lost three, it'd be plus three. Um, so you get the idea on that one. So it has a slight little positive charge to it now. Now it is referred to as a cation. Um, our atom that stole the electron um, now has a plus or a minus one 
charge to it. Um, it has one extra electron than it normally would have, which means that it has one more negative than it normally does. So um, not enough positives to balance out that negative. So a negative one, it has a slight negative charge to it now. Um, and now that's referred to as an anion. So the ability for these guys to share um, or steal their electrons and become or uh, an anion or a cation really matters when it comes to bonding for these. Um, so very interesting uh, type of bond, just the theft of an electron overall. Um, so you can see ionic bonding here, a very strong form of bond um, that allows uh, things to dissolve and bond inside of uh, uh, salts and crystals and things like that so dissolve inside of water. Um, very interesting type of bond. Uh, so you can kind of understand that that positive and negative, um, since they have that cation anion concept, can be very easily broken down by polar substances. Um, so you can see that positive for our hydrogen here bonds to that negatively charged chlorine and it steals it away. It breaks it apart from sodium chloride, from salt. Um, and that's what allows it uh, salt to dissolve in the water. It's that ability to break apart those ionic bonds from a polar substance. And that's how salt dissolves in water. Very interesting concept. So we already kind of went through hydrogen bonds. Um, it's just that attraction from a magnetic force. You can see that there. Um, holding two electrons or two atoms together. There are no sharing of electrons. There's no theft or no sharing. There are no true bonds being formed. Um, it's just a an electrochemical interaction um, where two atoms are held together by uh, electrochemical magnetic forces kind of thing. Um, now, every single time an atom changes uh, or gets rid of or accepts an atom, um, it's going to have a, ch a transfer of energy. Either it's going to gain energy or it's going to lose energy when it does that. So if you get if you get an electron, you're going to gain some energy. Um, if you give away an electron, you're going to lose some of your energy. And that kind of makes sense. Electrons, um, they sp spin around really fast, and as you give them away, you're going to give away the energy that's contained inside of them. So um, these types of reactions, this giving away energy and this gaining of energy, um, are referred to as redox reactions, and that stands for oxidation or reduction reactions. Um, so every time that an ionic bond forms, there's going to be a gaining or a, a loss of energy from one to another atom. Um, so the cation is going to becoming uh, going to become an, a positive charge, which means it's going to give away an atom. Um, so it's going to become re uh, reduced. It's going to give away an atom. Um, the other um, atom that receives that electron is going to be referred to as oxidized. It's going to gain um, some electrons. So uh, it gets confusing there if you look at it the other way around. Um, so oxidizing is the loss of electrons, but the oxidizing agent or the reducing the or thing that's being re uh, reduced is going to receive an electron. It gets really confusing on these terms. Um, so uh, the reducing agent is going to give um, a an electron to the oxidizing agent, but the oxidizing agent is being reduced by the oxidizing <laughs> reagent. It's, it gets really confusing. Um, so all you really need to worry about is oxidation and reduction overall. So if an, a reduction um, occurs when you gain electrons, oxidizing occurs when you lose electrons. So if you lose some electrons, you're being oxidized. If you gain some electrons, you're being reduced. Um, Fairly easy on that one. Just stick with that. Um, it makes it pretty easy. So chemical shorthand, um, reactants. You've probably heard these before in chemistry or in biology before. Um, a chemical reaction. You've got your reactions here. Your reactants, the things that are going into a chemical reaction, the stuff you start with. Um, and then you've got your products, the stuff that's going to be created after said chemical reaction. Um, you have a synthesis reaction. Um, which is going to build things up. You're going to take two things that are separate, to put them together, and build something entirely new from them. So you can see that here. We have our sodium and our oxygen, uh, sulfur, sorry, um, and we put those together and we get our sulfur oxide right there. So you can also have a decomposition reaction, 
um, decomposition, the tearing down, breaking apart of things. Um, so you're going to break apart something. This would also be our reactants and these are our products. Um, and you're going to break apart one thing into two or more products. Um, so our one oxygen, two uh, water molecules, um, or two, sorry, uh, two hydrogen sulfide molecules, or hydrogen, uh, I can't speak today, um, or two hydrogen peroxide molecules, excuse me, um, have been broken apart into two water and two oxygen molecules. A very important reaction, which uh, will come back into play in the lab for this course. Um, we have an exchange reaction where substances are uh, reacting to just switch. Um, so you can see here we have hydrogen chloride and sodium hydroxide, and now they switch. We have sodium chloride and water. Um, so our H and, and, um, H and o, uh, OH bonded together, and our NaCl bonded together. Um, and you can see they just switch, so they exchange, and it's an exchange reaction. Um, you've probably also heard of solvents and solutes and things like that in earlier chemistry classes um, or earlier biology courses when it comes to diffusion and osmosis and things like that. Um, you have your solvent, and that's the dissolver. In this case, it's water. You can see that here. It's dissolving salt. Um, our solvent is the water. Our solute is the stuff that's going to be dissolved in the solvent. So the solvent is going to do the dissolving. The solute is going to be dissolved in the solvent. Um, now once the solute dissolves in the solvent, you get salt water, aka a solution. Um, and that's pretty important in chemistry having the proper balances, especially inside of the body and things as well. Um, but if you're doing chemical reactions and things like that, it's important to have the proper balances of solutes and solvents um, in your reactions and things like that so stuff works like it should. Um, now having proper balances inside the body as well as for growing microbes and things like that, culturing them, making their media is also extremely important as well. Um, so you have to pay attention to these solute solvent concentrations in a solution. Um, now there's multiple different types of solutions. Um, you're probably familiar with the concept of uh, water and oil being I mean, capable of mixed together. You can't mix those two things together. Um, and the why has to do with how they're put together. Um, now, you've probably seen um, the little drug, they mix it together. You've probably seen them form the little balls, the little uh, bubbles that the oxygen or the, the oil floats around on top of the water, and you can't mix them together no matter how much you shake it. Um, so oxygen or the, the oil repels the water, um, which means oil is something called hydrophobic. It does not dissolve in water. The water molecules um, are, are sorry cannot break it down. Um, the oil molecules themselves are hydrophobic. They get rid of water. They repel water away from them. The water is incapable of bonding with them. It can't strip away parts of the oil molecules. Um, so it can't dissolve it. No matter how long oil sits there, it will never dissolve in water. Um, where on the other hand of that, you have hydrophilic um, molecules, things that dissolve in water quite regularly. Um, and this would be things like salt and sugar, um, things that people uh, bake with, cooking things a lot. Um, lots and lots of chemistry uh, things, lots of stuff in microbiology that we dissolve in auger all the time. Um, is going to be hydrophilic, which means it regularly and readily um, dissolves in water. So the water molecules strip away um, the other atoms and things from the, the solute, the thing that you're trying to dissolve. Um, so if you're hydrophobic, you won't dissolve in water. If you're hydrophilic, you will. Um, now, there are some interesting things out there which are referred to as amphiphatic, um, which have properties of both on the same molecule. Um, oil and water, ha or oil happens to be one of those, phospholipids, um, and it forms a bubble. So the hydrophilic heads that love water stay on the outside, or hydrophobic heads, uh, sorry, hydrophilic heads that, stay, that love water uh, um, stay on the outside that can't dissolve. Um, the hydrophobic tails stay on the inside that, that hate the uh, water, and it forms a little ball. Um, and that's what keeps them from being able to be dissolved. Very interesting process. So they have both properties, that hydrophilic and hydrophobic, on the same molecule. Um, and that's referred to as amphiphatic. 
Um, you've probably heard of the pH scale before all the time. pH stands for the power of hydrogen. Um, and that refers to how acidic or how basic um, a solution is. Now what that really refers to is how much hydrogen or how much OH hydroxyl ions um, are found inside of that solution. So the more hydrogen ions that a solution has in it compared to anything else, the more acidic it is. The more OH um, that it has compared to anything else, the more basic it is. Um, so the pH scale ranges from 0 to 14 um, based on the uh, pH, uh, or based on the concentration of hydrogen ions. Um, it's a log, um, so it goes up at a very set scale, a base set scale um, from zero. So if you have, if you're a, a very acidic solution at zero, you have the uh, maximum amount of hydrogens that you possibly can have in you. Um, you're very acidic, it'll break down anything in pretty much in the world. Um, if you are pH of one, you have a set unit below that of hydrogens, two set unit below that, and down to seven. And seven is considered neutral where the number of OHs and the number of Hs balance each other out. So you have five OHs, five Hs, they balance each other out. Now a pH of zero can have 14 quadrillion Hs, and it can still have a couple of OHs in there. It can have quite a lot, actually. But the number of Hs overall is just so great that it still classifies it as a zero. The farther you get down to seven, the more those numbers balance each other out until you get to a seven and they counteract each other. There can either be zero H's or zero OH's or they counteract each other and they, the, there's 14 5, uh, million, 14 million and they're uh, overall just zero. So it really doesn't matter. Um, but the farther you get away from seven to 14, the more OH's there are in this exact same way. It goes up in the same base scale. Um, and that's how that works. So very acidic solutions, things like uh, battery acid, stomach acid. Um, on the other end of that, you have the um, things like soaps and detergents, very slippery, slimy substances. Um, that's kind of the easiest way to tell them apart. So you can see here our base scale. Um, it's just a base one um, of how this goes up. And you can see um, the, type, the loss of hydrogen molecules um, as you go up and how many there are. Um, in each pH. So super cool. Uh, check that one out and dig a little deeper if you want into the pH scale. So the last little bit of this lecture is going to finish up with organic versus inorganic molecules. Um, what makes up the human body as well as the microbes? Um, what are they? How are they put together? Um, and how do they work? So let's go ahead and dig into that one real quick. So organic versus inorganic molecules. You've probably heard these terms before. Um, organic versus inorganic. So we're going to talk about organic molecules, being this is a microbiology course. Organic usually refers to things that are produced or associated with living organisms. Um, so we're going to kind of gloss over the inorganics real quick. Inorganic molecules are usually quite small. Um, they don't really have a lot of atoms in them. They're almost always bonded ionically, whereas uh, organic molecules, on the other hand, can be quite large. Um, they all will always contain carbon and hydrogen bonded together. It will always be there no matter what. Um, and they're almost always, always, always going to be covalently bonded. Um, and that's kind of the characteristics of organic versus inorganic molecules. Um, so we're going to focus on the organics being as though they're associated with living organisms, um, and the inorganics, things like water, ammonia, and, uh, ions, and things like that. Um, we're going to gloss over those. So there are really only four types of organic molecules um, that we're going to focus on for this course. So carbohydrates, aka uh, sugars, uh, things like that, lipids, which are fats, proteins, which you find in nuts and uh, meats and things, um, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, um, and the things that make them up. So um, if you look at a brick wall, um, you'll see that the brick wall as a whole is a big giant wall, but it has small little building blocks that build it up, each one of those little individual bricks. Um, and that's kind of the way that biological molecules work the same way too. Um, you have the overall brick wall, aka the overall, overall carb carbohydrate, or the overall lipid, or the overall protein. Um, but there are smaller things that make up each one of those carbohydrates, each one of those proteins, each one of those nucleic acids, and things like that. 
um, called a subclass molecule. Um, so we're going to talk about what the molecules are, um, what the subclass molecules are, and kind of what they're useful for in a biological sense. So a carbohydrate. Carbohydrates. This word's super easy. Carbon. Water. Every single two hydrogens, one oxygen. H. Two. O has a carbon bonded to it, carbohydrate. That's what a carbohydrate is. You can see four of them up here in the corner. Um, every single one of our carbons right here, sorry, sorry, I drew the wrong one, has a water bonded to it, carbon, water bonded to it, carbon, water bonded to it. You get the idea. Um, and that's what a carbohydrate is. That's on paper the definition of a carbohydrate. Um, now, what makes up a carbohydrate? What are they useful for? What do they do? Um, well, the subclass molecule, the smallest form of a carbohydrate, that's literally the definition of a carbohydrate that makes up the carbon-hydrogen thing, is something called a monosaccharide. Um, it's going to be a very simple sugar that contains three or four carbons in it, usually three, um, and you can see them right up here. This is glucose, a monosaccharide, mono meaning one, saccharin meaning sugar. So one sugar molecule. One sugar molecule here, fructose, one sugar molecule. Those are monosaccharides. Glucose, fructose, and galactose, ribose, deoxyribose, things that make up DNA and RNA, um, are other forms of monosaccharides. Now, monosaccharides are usually super sweet to the taste. Um, they're really easy for the body to break down. Um, if your body or other organisms, microbes in particular, have the choice of eating carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and all that stuff, they're going to break these down first. So if you gave them a candy bar that has four pieces of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids in equal amounts, and they ate it all at once, um, the carbohydrates are going to get broken down first. It's the greatest source of energy, um, easiest thing to break down, um, and that's what the body and most microbes and things are going to go after first if they can. Um, just because it's got so much energy and it's so easy to break apart. Um, so it's usually really sweet, these monosaccharides, um, because they have, they're so energy rich that you know our bodies kind of evolved to eat them. Um, seek those sweet things out because they're so rich in energy, our body se se uh, seeks them or programmed to taste them as sweet. Um, they don't last very long. Um, our body breaks them down quite quickly, which is why if you eat a big meal full of noodles and something, um, you're usually quite quick, uh, hungry, quite quickly afterwards because those carbs, uh, carbs go away. Um, a disaccharide um, is going to be two monosaccharides bonded together. So you can see our glucose here and our fructose here and the little bond in the middle holding them together. Um, that's sucrose now. Uh, table sugar, sucrose, that's a disaccharide. Di meaning two, saccharide meaning sugar. Um, so two monosaccharides stuck together is another form of a carbohydrate. Um, sucrose, lactose, the milk sugar, maltose, uh, malted milk balls and whoppers and things like that if you like those. Um, it's the sugar that's in there. And they're usually almost always sweet to the taste. Our body breaks those down quite quickly, um, but it does have a little tougher time. It takes a little more energy to break apart that bond there than it does to just eat um, one that doesn't break it apart. So there's a little more energy that's involved with that, but not a ton. Um, and it's usually used for a little more energy storage. So plants might form sucrose um, to just kind of store some energy away for a little while, break it down later. Um, lactose kind of the same way. It's just energy storage to kind of uh, be used for later, for some sort of source later. Um, now polysaccharide is kind of the big end game for carbohydrates. Polysaccharide is going to be one, two, three, four, five, at the very minimum, strung together. Carbohydrates, monohydrate, uh, So one, two, three, four, five. At the very minimum, monosaccharides strung together in a big long chain. Um, so polysaccharides are usually not going to be very sweet to the taste. Um, they're almost always going to be used for energy storage, um, things like starch in the form of a potato. Um, you know, it's, they the plant eats the potato when the environment goes bad. It just breaks down all that starch um, and it just stores it down there. Um, in that giant tuber underneath the ground until it needs it, um, or structural support, forming things like chitin, um, cell walls for fungus and mushrooms, um, the cell walls uh, or the exoskeleton of insects is formed out of chitin, 
cellulose, the structural support in plants, how they stand upright. Um, cellulose is structural support molecules and things like that. Polysaccharides are very strong. Um, they don't break down very easily. Um, if you've ever tried to bo uh, boil a starch and put it into a water solution, it's awful. It does not want to dissolve. Um, so those things usually don't taste very good, and they're almost always going to be used for something other than um, an energy source instantly, a very quick energy source. Um, they're going to be used for storage and breaking down later. Um, now, interesting to think about, if you eat a potato, which is literally nothing but starch, they taste good. Um, so when you break, uh, when you cut that potato up and you fry it, what happens is you break apart those ch long chains of polysaccharides um, via the heat and the frying into little small monosaccharides and disaccharides and things like that that are sweet. Um, so you start to produce monosaccharides and disaccharide sugars when you break apart the polysaccharides with all the heat of the frying, and that's why french fries taste good. So interesting little tidbit. Um, our next one's going to be a lipid. You know these as fats, pretty common. Um, they're going to have way more carbons, way more hydrogens than they do anything else. And that's the key word of a lipid there. Um, they're also going to be nonpolar and insoluble in water. You cannot dissolve lipids in water. That's just kind of one of the sad facts of biology. It's just not going to happen. Um, that's how they're put together. So simple lipids um, can have one carbon, one hydrogen, and one oxygen. Um, just like these kind of size, simple guys. And then you can have triglycerides, which have three fatty acids linked to a glyceride molecule. And this is a... Uh, um, typical fatty or triglyceride. So we've got our fatty acid, one, two, three of them, linked to our glyceride here. So these are a little um, a little more complicated. Now what's really of interest here um, is going to be saturated versus an unsaturated fat. Now this refers to nutrition and how the um, organism is going to break these down, how much energy is going to be required to break apart these types of fat. Um, now you can see here a saturated fat um, if you have your little glyceride heads, you get the little lipids that hang down, the little fatty acid tails, they're going to be straight lines. Um, saturated fats, they have the maximum number of hydrogens bonded to everything that they can. So every single carbon has one, two, three, four hydrogens bonded to it, or as many bonds as it possibly can form. The num maximum number of bonds in this is bonded to it, and the maximum number of atoms it can hold are there. So it is saturated with hydrogens, um, pretty much how that goes. If your body tries to break this down, it's going to take a lot of energy to break apart all those hydrogens uh, from the carbons. It's going to take a ton of energy to do that. So your body would much rather go, eh, I'll just eat some carbohydrates. If you eat a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of saturated fats, your body doesn't need to break down the saturated fats, so it throws it away for storage. Um, and just breaks down the carbohydrates. So the saturated fats get passed over, um, which is why they're so bad to eat in our diets. An unsaturated fat, on the other hand, you can see down here, um, is missing two hydrogens. So they should be right there, but they're not. So the fact that it's missing those two hydrogens leads to it having a slight kink in it. You have one tail that's straight and one of them that's not um, because of that bond there um, that's missing. So double bonded carbon um, causes that slight kink. Now, when it's missing that kink, um, it means that it doesn't uh, sit together as closely to its neighbor as it should. Um, it's got a little, um, it's kind of holding its elbow out so people can't get as close to it if you like. Um, so not, things aren't packed quite as tightly together. Um, so if your body tries to break this down, it has a little easier time breaking it apart because there's not as many bonds in it. So your body will go for an unsaturated fat over a saturated fat to break it down for an energy source all day long. Um, how do you tell these things apart? Saturated fats are solid at room surface at temperature, things like butter or Crisco, and unsaturated fats are things like oils, vegetable oils that aren't solid or that are, that are liquid um, at room temperature. Why does this matter? Unsaturated and saturated fats, um, saturated lipids, the uh, phospholipids and things make up the surface of our cell membranes. Um, the concentration of saturated versus unsaturated makes the cell membrane fluid, uh, makes it able to float around and move around. And that makes, uh, that's kind of how our cells work. Very important to that. We'll get into that stuff later in this course. Um, so, 
Complex lipids have fatty acids and glycerols as well as other stuff bonded to them. Um, carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, other elements and things like that. Like phospholipids that have phosphorus added to them um, and things like that. Um, so phospholipid in particular, um, like I just mentioned, has our phosphate group up here and two fatty acids. It can be either one uh, saturated and one saturated here, or in this case, one saturated and one unsaturated. So you can have either. It really just kind of depends. And that makes up our cell membrane, um, as well as the cell membrane of every other cell on the planet. And that's kind of one of the key characteristics of all cells. They all have a cell membrane. And you have sterols. Um, which are four fused carbon rings with lots of functional groups. You have cholesterols and things like that um, that are stuck inside of our cell membranes that allow it to be a little more fluid um, and things like that. It helps add a little bit of rigidity so our cell membranes aren't going to fall apart. Um, and they're technically classified as lipids because they don't break down in water. Um, and that's kind of where that comes into. They're not lipids in the sense of uh, carbon and hydrogens bonded together in big long chains, um, but that's why we uh, put them in there because they're insoluble in water. Now our next one are proteins. You're probably familiar with proteins. Um, if you eat meat, that's where you're getting your proteins from, or nuts and things like that. Um, that's where proteins are going to be found a lot in nature. Um, what is a protein? Well, a protein is, if you ask, uh, if the protein is the brick wall, um, the subunits that make up our proteins are going to be amino acids. Um, so amino acids, amino acids, amino acid, amino acid, big long chain of amino acids all stuck together makes up a protein. Um, and that's what a protein is. Subclass molecules, amino acids, stick them all together, you get a protein. Now, um, there are 20 amino acids and you can see them all right here. Um, here's the name of them, here's the structure, and you may notice that this little structure right here remains the same for all the amino acids, regardless of which one you are. Whereas these structures down here, these are called side chains or the R group, they all are different. The top part is what makes an amino acid an amino acid. That's kind of like what makes a car a car is having an engine, four wheels, and a door, um, or doors, but it doesn't matter what color, what, you know, if it's a truck or a van, it's still a car. Um, this is the four wheels, the engine, and the doors. This is the blue the van, this is the green truck, this is whatever variation it is that makes that amino acid a specific amino acid, or the Ford a specific Ford, or blah blah blah. Um, you just have to have this top part right here to be considered an amino acid. There are 20 different forms of amino acids, there are more than that, um, but there are 20 that are considered essential for life on the planet. Um, every single living organism must have all 20 of those amino acids that we're aware of to function. Some organisms very, uh, require more, uh, but all, 20 require, or all organisms require those 20. Um, you can't make all of them, you can make the majority of them, um, but some of them you have to get from your diet. Um, so you have to get those from a healthy diet. Um, so you take some amino acids and you stick a couple of them together, you get something called a polypeptide, a little small short chain of amino acids that does something. A bunch of amino acids that can form, uh, that can perform an action or stimulate uh, something in the body, a um, fully functional protein called a, uh, a peptide, a small singular peptide. Um, that can be a small thing like oxytocin, um, stimulates contractions during childbirth and things like that. And if you take one peptide, a fully functional protein, and another peptide, and you stick them together, you get a polypeptide, meaning more than one peptide. So you can see up here, this is hemoglobin. We have one peptide, two peptides, three, and four. You stick them all together, and you get a polypeptide, um, one giant functional group of proteins, um, of peptides that are all working together um, for one collective group. Um, and that's a polypeptide. So once again, here's our little structure of our amino acid. This is what makes an amino acid an amino acid, this part right here. This is the amino group. This structure right here, two hydrogens and a nitrogen, makes an amine, that's what this is called. Um, and this is the amino group. This is carboxylic acid, one carbon and a water molecule kind of struck apart, um, makes up a carboxylic acid, and this is what this one is. Down here is our side chain. This is what changes. This is the, if it's a Ford, a Lexus, uh, you know, 
Porsche or whatever it happens to be. Four wheels, doors, and our engine, and that's the car part up here. This is what makes the amino acid the amino acid. Down here at the bottom is the thing that can change, the side chain or the R group, that makes each amino acid unique and special and gives it its individual properties um, for each individual amino acid. Now, how do you form a protein? Um, well, proteins are made in ribosomes, so the ribosome has this long chain of mRNA out of the other side, and then the proteins come in, or amino acids come in from one side, um, the correct amino acid comes in from the mRNA, lines up, and it puts it together, and it spits out the other end. Complicated process, get into that later. Um, anyway, um, so the way that they come out of the ribosome matters. Um, each particular amino acid is either going to have a positive or a negative charge to it, and the way that those charges come out in order matters for the way that the protein folds. Um, you want a protein to fold in the proper way, in the proper uh, order, with the positives and negatives interacting in the proper formats and proper ways, so the protein works the way that it should. Um, if the protein doesn't work the way that it should, it's just a waste to make, it's biologically useless, um, it just costs a lot of energy. So you want to make sure that it's put together the way that it should. So um, proteins are folded, like I mentioned. Um, you fold them to make them work. You fold them to give them dimension. You fold them to give them ability. And you also don't want a big, giant, long string floating around. So imagine having a, an entire yarn ball that's just spread out. You want to kind of clump it all together and kind of make it take up as little space as it can. Um, it also keeps the chances of getting broken uh, reduced as well. Well, anyway. Um, when protein comes out of the ribosome, the positives and the negatives come out in the correct order. Um, and when it does, the positives, if they're over here, will stick to the negative in the correct order, the next negative. And then that negative will stick to a positive, and it'll start folding as it comes out of the ribosome in a very distinct way. Um, it's put together in a proper way. The uh, DNA knows how to do all that stuff, and we'll get into that later. Um, but as it's put together, it folds. Now there's four levels of protein folding. Um, as the ribosome produces the RNA, or produces the uh, protein, excuse me, the first little bit of it that comes out is going to be a big straight line. And that's going to be considered primary structure. And you can see that down here. This protein does not work. It doesn't do anything. It's just a big yarn ball um, that's been uncoiled and thrown in the floor. It doesn't do anything. Well, as it starts to come out, the positive here will stick to the negative right there. So it'll start to fold back a little bit on itself. And when it does, it's going to form one of these kind of structures as they start to fold. And that's called a beta pleated sheet. It looks kind of like the um, little, uh, if you ever made one of the um, little dolls out of the uh, brown paper bags with the accordion legs um, in elementary school, that looks like their legs. Or as it starts to come out of the ribosome, it will curl and form an alpha helix, a single helar helix instead of a double helix, a beta helix. Or sorry, a double helix. It'll form an alpha helix, a single helix. Um, so it really just depends on how that works. So that's secondary form folding. Primary is a straight, uncoiled line of amino acids, whereas secondary has a slight curl or curve or a kink to it, kind of like an accordion. And that's secondary folding, beta pleated sheet. Now these proteins don't work yet either, you can see it down here, this is secondary structure, and they're not functional yet either. We have to go up to tertiary structure, where these beta pleated sheets and the uh, alpha helixes start to curl back on one another. So as the ribosome grows, the uh, amino acid chain, the alpha helixes, the beta pleated sheets and stuff will start to get so long that they curl back on one another. And the alpha helixes stick to it here, and the beta pleated sheets and things, they start to form uh, giant long complex connections as the protein grows. Now eventually what will happen is this little protein will stop being produced, the ribosome will let it go, and you'll have a big blob of functional alpha helixes, beta pleated sheets and stuff all put together floating around inside of the cell. And that's considered tertiary structure. Those alpha helixes, those beta pleated sheets all stuck to one another, all fold back upon one another, and that's a fully functional protein. It can do something now. It can work as an enzyme, a structural protein, transport protein. It can do something now for the cell. And then if you have a protein in quaternary structure, 
you have one of those fully functional proteins that's all blobbed up in tertiary structure and another fully functional protein in tertiary structure that's all blobbed up and they stick together to form a giant ball of fully functional protein aka hemoglobin same kind of idea um, so that's just one or more fully functional proteins in tertiary structure bonded together um, it just allows the cell to function and do more things um, than it could have by itself with one protein. So four proteins are stronger than one. You get the idea on that. Um, now, proteins um, are sensitive little things. They can be broken apart quite easily. Um, and this is kind of what causes death a lot of times. This is how we kill microbes. This is how um, we kill them in the washing machine, when you kill them when you're boiling them, and things like that. Um, heat, pH, UV light, radiation, all of these things break apart the peptide bonds that hold the amino acids together. So if you're all holded, folded up in the proper way, all the positives and negatives are properly aligned, and somebody hits you with a bunch of heat, and all those positives and negatives all of a sudden just fall apart, and they fold and they unfold and they just loose together, um, and that's what these things do. Heat breaks apart bonds, pH breaks apart bonds, high acidic, high basic environments, UV light breaks apart bonds, radiation breaks apart these bonds that hold proteins together. Um, and once those bonds are broken, they, the protein just floats out into a uh, primary structure again, big long chain. Um, and then once it's broken, it's never going to be able to work again. Now you might remove the heat, the acid might go away, the radiation might stop, but the chances of that protein being folding back together just upon itself, the right positives folding to the right negatives just randomly, even though it's when it's not coming out of the ribosome, are pretty much going to be zero. Um, it would be like having a watch smushing it all up together and then just hoping that it randomly comes back together. You need someone to make the thing, and that's what the ribosome does. Without somebody pro uh, properly directing the protein to go back together, it's not going to work. Um, so once a protein's been broken apart um, from its tertiary structure, um, it's referred to as denatured. Um, and once it's denatured, it doesn't work anymore. The organism that was relying on that protein is probably going to have a bad time um, and may even die. So denaturing proteins is a good way to kill organisms. Um, what do proteins do? Um, lots of different things. They can pretty much do anything that we need. Um, they can serve as enzymes to help start or speed up chemical reactions. They can move large things in and out of the cell um, that we might have a difficult time uh, doing otherwise. Um, it's too big to naturally just float across the cell membrane. Our cell can use a protein to bring it in. Um, our cells use proteins to recognize the exterior conditions of the cells. So your cells hold up proteins that say, hey, this is my cell. Um, so your immune system doesn't prey upon it and kill it, thinking it's a bacteria or an invader or something. Um, proteins make up the structural support of your cell. It's how it moves around. Um, flagella and things like that, cilia. Um, it makes up the cytoskeleton, how your cell stays... Uh, blown up and not just collapsing as a giant ball of ooze. It's um, how it stays um, inflated. The cytoskeleton adds some rigidity to it. How stuff moves inside of the, set, the cell moves around on the cytoskeleton. Um, so without proteins, um, the world would be a vastly different place and our cells would look totally different. Um, so once again, amino acids make up proteins. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, amino acids make up... Uh, no, sorry. Um, Wait a minute, sorry, sorry, this should say nucleic acids, not amino acids. There we go. So this is nucleic. There we go, so nucleic not acids, not amino acids. So um, amino acids make up proteins. Nucleic acids are a totally different thing. Nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. So nucleic acids um, are going to be found in every cell on the planet. That's one of our characteristics of living planets. They have our living cells. They have ev both DNA and RNA inside of them. Um, viruses have one or, or the other, but not both. And that's one of the characteristics again. So there's two forms of amino acids, DNA and RNA. Pretty easy on that one. Um, and if you're DNA or RNA, no matter what you are, you're going to be made up of something called a nucleotide. And that's a nucleotide right there. And there are five different types of nucleotides. Um, adenine, 
thymine, guanine, and cytosine. A, T, G's, and C's. You probably heard that a bunch. Those are the four that are found in DNA. Now, if you move over to RNA, we're going to get rid of our thymine, and we're going to replace the thymine with uracil. So A, U, G, and C, and that's going to be found in RNA. So five uh, nitrogenous bases overall in total, um, and four... Um, um, uh, it, sorry, four in DNA and four in RNA. The T uh, is found in DNA and the U's in RNA. So nucleotides are made up of one of these, or sorry, these three things, one phosphate group, one sugar, and one of those five nitrogenous bases that I just mentioned. So you have a phosphate backbone here, one sugar, car uh, five carbon sugar. It's going to be either uh, ribose if you're DNA, uh, RNA or deoxyribose if you're DNA, and one of those four uh, or five um, nitrogenous bases up here in the corner. So if you're DNA, you're going to have A, T, G, or C here. If you're RNA, you're going to have A, U, G, or C here. So these are nitrogenous bases um, over here, our five carbon sugar, our phosphate group backbone, and this is going to make up a nucleotide in total. Nucleotides are our subclass molecules that make up nucleic acids. Um, there are two types of nitrogenous bases. We have purines and purinidines. Our purines are adenine and guanine. You can see they have our two uh, bonds here, our larger of the two forms of nucleic uh, of nitrogenous bases, and our purinidines down here. Cytosine, thymine, and uracil, the smaller of the uh, nitrogenous bases. So DNA and RNA are nucleic acids. Um, it's going to be the A's, T's, G's, and C's bonded together in a very specific order. Um, so if you have an A on one side um, over here, you're going to have a T on the other side if you're DNA. Um, if you're RNA, you have an A on one side, you're going to have a U on the other side. So if DNA, you're going to have a G on one side and a C on the other. Um, you get the idea on this one. So you have DNA, double strand, RNA, singular strand. So you have R, uh, RNA, you have our A, you know, C, U. And the order um, of how those are put together, um, as well as in DNA, the order of how those are put together. Um, let's go ahead and make that a G since this is DNA over here. Um, so the order of how those are put together is going to determine what the... Uh, message overall is going to be read to make a protein or to make the organism overall. Um, so it's kind of like a book um, or a word, if you like. The combination of ATGs and Cs and the letters and the orders that they're put together in are going to translate to producing an organism, producing proteins and things like that. Um, and how you look and how you behave and how your body functions um, are all going to be controlled by your DNA and RNA. So. Um, DNA is the uh, molecule of genetic material, the encoding um, material that allows us to pass on our genetic information to the next generation to create a new version of ourself. Um, so what's going to happen is when cells divide, you're going to have one piece of DNA that's eventually going to be unzipped. Um, a new copy of each side is going to be made. So you end up with two new cells that have one copy of the original DNA, you see here in the blue, and then a new copy in orange added to them. So um, you're going to have half the original cell DNA and a new half added, and that's how we're going to replicate DNA to replicate our organisms. So we're going to give half of our DNA away in a new cell um, to create uh, a new version of an organism. So DNA is the molecule that allows us to do that. Um, and our last little bit here is ATP, the energy molecule for cells. This is cellular gasoline. It's only found in cells. Cells are the only things that can produce this naturally. Cells are the only things that can naturally use this as well. I um, mean, it's essentially just a nucleotide. You have a adenosine instead of a, um, um, right, uh, so right here. Um, it's our phosphate group, our 5-carbon sugar, and our uh, nitrogenous base right up here. 
Um, if you add in some phosphates, however, some extra phosphates, you add in one, you get adenosine diphosphate. You add in another one, you get adenosine triphosphate. ATP, ADP is what those stand for. Now, anything other than adenosine, the original amino acid itself, um, is going to have those extra phosphates added on. And those extra phosphate groups contain energy. The bonds that hold those extra phosphate groups on contain a lot of energy. And you can break these bonds apart to get the energy inside of them to power and uh, allow the cell to do things. Um, so it's cellular gasoline. So your cell makes ATP, bacteria make ATP, everything on the planet that uses energy in some way, shape, or form is going to make ATP. Um, and that ATP, biologically speaking anyway, and that ATP is going to be stored very, very briefly. It does not last very long. Um, and then almost instantaneously, those phosphate groups are going to be stripped away. The energy that's stored inside of them is going to be used to power the cells, uh, chemical reactions to either make more ATP, build the cell up, um, make cellular products, or things like that. Um, but this is the gasoline that powers cells. Um, it is recyclable, so we steal the ATP part, um, we steal off the last uh, phosphate group, it goes down to ADP, the ADP is then recycled back into ATP, um, so we don't ever really run out of this stuff unless you run out of things to feed, uh, make energy with in the first place. So if you run out of, uh, you know, you die or you don't eat, um, you won't be able to make more of this. Um, so this is the uh, cell gasoline, the material that powers your cells, so ATP. Um, very, very, very important molecule, the energy of life, if you like. Um, so this is all I've really got for this lecture. Um, if you have anything else you'd like to discuss or you have any questions about this, please feel free to let me know, send me an email, reach out. Um, other than that, have a nice rest of your day.